Good evening. Uh, I'm Scott, Scott Saul of Berkeley's English Department, and it's my great pleasure to welcome you uh, to the latest event in the Arts Plus Design Mondays here at the Berkeley Art Museum, a conversation uh, with Mark Greif and Linda Williams. Every Monday night through April, and with the exception of holidays like next Monday, President's Day, BAM, PFA, will be holding events sp sponsored by Berkeley's Arts Plus Design Initiative, events that are designed to bring together thinkers from on and off campus and audiences from on and off campus too. And it's great to see people from come in here from different places uh, tonight. In two weeks, for example, uh, as part of this Future of Cultural Criticism series, um, we'll be hosting a conversation on technology, race, and popular culture with Jenna Wortham, who many of you might know. She's a staff writer for the New York Times Magazine, host of their Still Processing podcast with Wesley Morris, and one of the liveliest voices around. So please come to that in two weeks. Um, before we get going with tonight's event, I wanted to thank the folks who have made it possible uh, BAM PFA staff, Sherry Goodman and Dave Taylor, Alan Tansman, Rebecca Egger, and Colleen Barroso at the Townsend Center for the Humanities, um, and Shannon Jackson and Lauren per Person of the Arts and Design Initiative. Uh, now, when I emailed Mark Greif on November 6th of last year uh, to propose that this conversation might revolve around the issues body intellect resistance, I had little sense that a few months later, we'd be seeing millions of people gathering their bodies together in cities across America and the globe to protest the inauguration of Donald Trump. Little sense that on a scale and with a regularity that seems unprecedented, masses of people will be putting their bodies on the line to resist the policies of the Trump administration. Little sense that to take two local examples, 5,000 people would gather at San Francisco's Ocean Beach this weekend to spell out resist with their bodies or that, personally speaking, I'd be sporting a Smokey the Bear Resist button on my jacket, and it has Smokey lighting a fire. Right? And here we are uh, in the middle of the resistance, and here we are with two thinkers who, I would say, are the perfect people to help us reflect on the possibilities and dangers of our moment, how we might use our bodies and minds to define the resistance, and think through what vision of life and what vision of a just, just society we are resisting for. Mark Reif is a co-founder of the magazine N Plus One and recently the author of Against Everything. Of him, Zadie Smith has said, Greif writes a contrarian, skeptical prose that is at the same time never cynical. It opens out onto beauty and the possibility of change. Against Everything, which you see here, uh, explores an old-fashioned set of questions, ones that cut against the larger currents of our culture, as Greif writes, a lot of books tell you how to do the things you're supposed to do, but better. This book asks about those things you are supposed to do. Do you really do those things for the reasons that are supposed? What if our true reasons, your and mine, are not the ones usually proclaimed? If the right reasons to do things, to be good and true and righteous, in fact are wrong, if the usual wisdom is unwise. He takes these old-fashioned philosophical questions into very contemporary terrain, into the trenches of the Occupy and Black Lives Matter movements, into the gym, into our food-obsessed kitchens and dining rooms, into the virtual realms of YouTube and reality TV. Everywhere he asks about the nature of our commitments and the routines we fall into without considering their costs. And I want to give you one example of another passage in a wonderful essay um, uh, called Against Food. On food, sorry, not against food. On food. <laughs> it's against foodieism, I would say. Um, so he said he didn't want to read himself from his work, so I'm giving you a little bit more of a taste. Know thyself, said the ancient injunction. The unexamined life is not worth living, added Socrates. Modern prophets reformulated this for our changed times once we had become complacent about scientific examination, but stayed mystified by how to be. Become what you are. Know thy food, says the health ideology. Unexamined food is not worth eating. Common sense wisdom used to say you are what you eat, which meant put that donut down and pick up an apple. Choose God's first fruit over fried fluff. The health ideology says something that sounds similar, but is really very different, for it has become existential in grave, crowding out both common sense and the contemplation of true goals. Become what you eat. 
And this whole book is all that good and that thought-provoking. Uh, Linda Williams, who will be engaging uh, Mark Grief in conversation tonight, is a leading figure in film and media studies and a professor in film and media and rhetoric here at Cal. Unafraid, like Greif, to go against the grain, she has written field-defining books on hardcore, porno hardcore pornography. Yeah, I don't know why that word pornography doesn't trip off my tongue. I, okay, uh, hardcore pornography on race and American melodrama, and most recently on The Wire, in which she argues that the HBO series The Wire is great not because it is like Greek tragedy, but rather because it is popular serial melodrama at its very finest. Across her body of work, she encourages us to develop what in The Wire are called soft eyes, the ability to take in a scene and learn from it by paying attention to both the center of the frame and its corners, the ability to take in not just what's said, but also what's not said, what's communicated by gesture, style, and by tone. Um, a last word on the format of tonight's event. Linda and Mark will talk for about an hour, and then we'll open it up to your questions. Okay. So please welcome Mark Greif and Linda Williams to the stage. You hear me? Oh, good. Okay. Well, I'm delighted to be here with, with Mark. Um, for those of you who have not yet had the pleasure of reading his book, which is still fairly recent, I'm going to try to ask questions that will lead us into the intricacies of the book. Um, and um, it's been just wonderful to get to know Mark both through his book and in person. So I'll just start with the obvious first question, how this book came to be out of uh, N plus one. Sure. Uh, thank you. Thank you, everyone, for coming when you should be at dinner, probably. Thank you, Linda, for doing this. I, um, I'm trying to dial back my um, deference and worship meter, but uh, Linda Williams's work, hardcore, and, and um, her work on body genres, which now you repudiate, maybe we'll discuss it, and melodrama have been totally crucial to um, anything that I've written about media. And, ah, yeah. okay. okay, I won't do that again. <laughs> uh, yes, thank you, <laughs> everyone. Yes, little did you know. <laughs> This is your life. What do I have behind you? Uh, anyway, um, the book, the, the book. Well, it's really a book. And, um, you know, one, one thing uh, that's satisfying about the way that it came together is that uh, for a long time I had had the hope that I would someday get to write a book of essays. Um, and indeed, in N plus one, this journal that we started, I was finally able to publish the kinds of essays that, that I thought uh, were, were what I genuinely wanted, what I would have liked to have read myself, and that was sort of the purpose of it, you know, what would someone who was you, who was like in the, li the public library alone looking for something to read, want to read? Aha! <laughs> um, and, of course, being in New York, the first thing I learned was that um, the conventional wisdom there is that no one uh, reads essays, no one likes essays, certainly no one publishes books of essays, um, which was in a way for the best because even I don't like essays that much. I actually like books, you know, where you have some idea and someone carries it through. And so um, I had these ideas of the books that I wanted to write, one which would take up uh, the conditions of contemporary life, the things that we learn to make difficult once again, even though it seems they've been made easy for us in other ways, food, sex. Uh, exercise and kind of movement of the body. And I was like, this is great. I'm going to write a 400 page book and um, I'll deeply research it. I'll learn the history of the gymnasium since the Greeks and so forth. But uh, at the time, I was, I was like a graduate student. I was in my 20s. Uh, certainly, no one wanted a book from me uh, other than my dissertation. They didn't really want my dissertation. And so, you know, the only thing possible uh, seemed to be well, maybe I could just think of the key things and write them down. And, in um, 20 pages or fewer. Uh, and, and so that's essentially the logic of the first few essays that you see up there. It's nice to have the visual aid. Um, and then I had this vision, you know, you're in your 20s. It's very clear that people uh, around you go on living. Um, not clear why they do, not clear why you should, uh, what are you living for, et cetera. And I was like, well, clearly the meaning of life would be the, the, um, the second important thing to write a book about. And, 
And um, as we all do, right, I would like doodle on napkins, my table of contents, and someday I'll write this, that, and the other. But again, it didn't seem possible to write such a book. No one wanted it. And so I thought, well, I could try a series of essays and, and, and test out these different questions. So the nice thing about this book, actually, is that um, when it produces the illusion of essays that in some way, I hope, were written together or are stages of an argument, it's in fact true because um, you know, this, this book, as you get it, um, I had imagined like an enormous banquet, several of them, that I would be able to feed the world. Uh, and in fact, that wasn't possible. So instead, these are just like these tiny bouillon cubes that, you know, if you were to drop them in warm water, uh, you'd get a, a thin, thin soup. Um, but, it, but it would taste in each section the, the same way. Thank you. <laughs> and, and taste is, is certainly the right, the right uh, metaphor there. Um, so it, it, it says against everything. And um, in fact, you are very contrary, and you set yourself up against a lot of things. Uh, uh, but uh, you aren't really against everything. And, and you say, I knew a philosopher to be a mind that was unafraid to be against everything. If it was corrupt, dubious, enervating, untrue to us, false to happiness. And this is your approach. Your approach is, it's not that you should all not do exercise the way, the way we do it in gyms. Um, and when I first started to read it, I felt, uh-oh, um, I've done this in, in a gym. Um, uh, but I realized you're, you're just saying there's better ways to do it. And, and so I felt, I felt once I realized that, it's really just thinking through what we do and why we do it, how we live, and how we might live better. Um, so you weren't really attacking me, and besides, <laughs> I swim outdoors, and that made me exempt from your critique I, anyway. <laughs> I was not attacking you, Linda. <laughs> That's the most important thing to know. Um, yes, and in fact, um, not to be too specific, but to pay tribute, my wife, Gabrielle, is here. And um, yeah, you, you know, I'm a slob um, and, you know, very unfit. Gabrielle, very athletic and capable. And um, there was a, an important and difficult passage in our relationship when I was writing uh, against exercise. Um, and, you know, drafts were lying around the house. And um, that's not, I mean, I asked Gabrielle to read it. But, uh, and she didn't say anything. She, you know, contributed intellectual and philosophical uh, objections, but uh, but when we were having a fight about something completely different later, uh, she was like, blah, 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 and moreover, you wrote that whole essay against exercise, against me, your <laughs> beloved, you know, because she was training for a marathon at the time, and I... <laughs> I was like completely shocked because this nothing could have been less true. And I said, I, I didn't write about, about you. I wrote it about my parents. Um, my horrible, impossible parents, you know. Uh, so there are biographical dimensions to it. But, um, but it's interesting because I, I don't think of the essay even, I mean, you're absolutely right what you say and very generous, but I don't think of it uh, ultimately as... Um, as even asking you to exercise better. In some sense, this is, I mean, not to, to pick on this, but it, it's, um, this is the very thing I fear. I think that the thought is, um, why? <laughs> why are you doing this? And um, if you think through your reasons, can you find yourself assenting to them? Um, and in your case, with swimming, and because of you, I believe that you can, right? You're like, actually, I do this for the right reasons. Um, but I couldn't say that of myself. Um, and it was an essay that was started, I, I told you, um, on a treadmill. I was on a treadmill um, and I looked around. This, it comes into the essay, but it's not an intellectual experience. So on the treadmill, it was winter, I was not that happy. Uh, and I looked around and all of a sudden everything changed. I saw you know, the man who was over there doing, uh, I think it's called a lat pull down. And um, I was like, oh my God, he's crucified on that, that rib of iron, you know? And, uh, and I saw the people on their bikes, and I was like, the bikes are riding them. I mean, it's a banal experience, right? But it just became clear that I was among the damned. Um, and I thought, you are damned, and you are damned, and you are damned. I, I, but then what was I? Um, I've actually never exercised in a gym since that time. Uh, it's not something I recommend, and I'll probably drop dead. Um, should I read? Read, read oh. those two bottom paragraphs on the right. Thank you. 
Just to get the flavor of it. Uh, well, part of it. In the gym, you witness people engaging in a basic biological process of self-regulation. All of its related activities reside in the private realm. A question then is why exercise doesn't stay private. It could have belonged at home with other processes it resembles. Eating, sleeping, defecating, cleaning, grooming, and masturbating. Exerciser, what do you see in the mirrored gym wall? You make the faces associated with pain, with tears, with orgasm, with the sort of exertion that would call others to your immediate aid. But you do not hide your face. You groan as if pressing on your bowels. You repeat grim labors as if mopping the floor. You huff and you shout and you strain. You appear in tight yet shapeless lycra costumes. These garments reveal the shape of the genitals and the mashed and bandaged breasts to others' eyes without acknowledging the lure of sex. That's what you Thank you. Yeah, that's just what it's like. I mean, <laughs> you've, been, you've been to gyms. Um, but in any case, that was not, uh, it was an experience, but it was not a properly intellectual experience. And, and I guess, you know, you go home and you think, did I, did I just have a, a kind of psychotic break? Um, or did I see something that's worth pursuing for me? And so my thought about, about many of the essays in the book um, was something much more, um, I hope, minimal than I can tell people how to do things better. It was something like, what would it take to be honest with myself, to be intellectually honest with myself about why I'm doing the things I do and why I spend my hours the way I spend them. Right, and this is the way you, this is the way you proceed throughout the book. And you notice that sex gets brought in very early and all of these essays, these, these, mm. these first four essays, really are about the body and, and about sex. The, 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 the second essay that we'll, we'll turn to in a moment is, is very interestingly about sex, and they all relate. Um, what I wanted to ask you to do is, is, early in your preface, you say, I taught myself to overtune, undo, deflate, rearrange, unthink, and rethink. And that's what you're doing in all of these essays. You're saying, this is the way it is. How could it be different? How could it be better? There's a kind of utopian streak. And there's even a kind of childlike. There's, mm -hmm. I can tell that your mother yes. is the adult, and you are the ch always the voice of the child. And they're having arguments with one another. Mm -hmm. um, but um, how did you teach yourself to do those things? Because mm. I'm a professor, and I never <laughs> learned to do it. <laughs> That's, I, I realized as you read that uh, that sentence that it, that's one of the sentences that um, you sort of hope will never be read out loud or you think <laughs> of it never being read out loud because it's, it seems boastful, right? I mean, who is this like super critic <laughs> who is able to overturn incredibly heavy trucks, or, you know, out dialectically sublate um, them? Uh, yeah, it is all about my mother, should be said. Um, I remember it was a mistake because he laughed so hard, but I, I once was trying to describe my childhood to a friend in those years of college when you're like, I, you know who I am, and you discover it. And I was like, I was, I was kind of raised a Freudian from birth. And the person laughed, and I was like, why is that funny? Um, and presumably, if it's a joke, well, no one else is laughing, that's good. But um, presumably because, right, everyone's raised a Freudian from birth in a sense because you want to sleep with your mother and kill your father. Um, it's not really... It's not the best part of Freud. Um, but it was true that my mother was, um, I mean, it was a particular moment in the 1970s. My mother was a research psychologist and uh, a kind of a believer in Freud. He was certainly on the shelves. Um, and I had, uh, and she was a feminist research psychologist, which is very important. She worked on how it was, child development, how it was that children are cult acculturated. Um, to play the roles of you know boys or girls, men and men and women, sex role theory, and um, so many of my earliest experiences were of being on the wrong side of the the one way glass. Although thinking about it, I don't know which is the wrong side, but I was on the experimenter side, and um, I would have to watch these children 
you know, having stories read to them by their parents while they were being coded for how many times, as it turns out, both uh, male and female parents, mothers and fathers would when reading to their boy children say, and what is that person doing? And what is that person doing? While with their daughters, they would say, and what is that person feeling? And what is that person feeling? You know, uh, and I would hear behind me the adults' pens clicking and stuff. Um, but the very fact of watching people be experimented, children be experimented upon <laughs> in a relatively kind way, um, but for the purposes of some kind of project of um, liberation, right? Uh, to liberate people from patriarchy or sexism. Um, and the kind of presuppositions which really were offered from when I was very small that in fact um, our conscious motives are not the real springs of our action. Um, one should always search in people's ticks and statements and words um, for their true intentions, all this kind of stuff. Uh, you know, four-year-olds can do that. <laughs> Five-year-olds can do that. Um, and so in a funny way, I mean, the only real answer to your question is that you read all sorts of people and find when you read Freud, it's somehow, for real, right? It's shattering. And when you read Nietzsche, it's shattering. And, and um, when you read Simone de Beauvoir, it's shattering. Uh, but there was something about the early 70s, I often think, that um, for a teeny child, uh, still, recognize, uh, still represented recognizably um, what has been maybe the closest thing I've experienced to a, a social utopia in my life, or at least the hope of it, you know, that it would be possible to live in a world of genuine equality and, and um, anti-sexism, anti-racism. Uh, and moreover, that like the, the people who would be able to do this would be the children, as it were. I mean, you see this even in, in Betty Friedan and elsewhere, these dedications. Uh, uh, it's actually, it's in, um, oh, it's in Robin Lakoff's book on, you know, sex, women and sexist language and so forth, or, or where they're like, you know, it's not going to work for my peers because they're monsters. <laughs> it may not work for me because I know that I grew in a world already gridded with these things, but the children, the sons and daughters. Um, and it's a weird, it's a weird goal to grow up with because certainly my experience of um, growing now to be a middle-aged person is just of a kind of endless betrayal and, and failure of, of these projects. Um, and it feels like my fault. <laughs> so that's, in a way, I think that's that structure in the book of, um, of how to talk to the parent. If you genuinely believe that this thing is possible and should be happening, and yet somehow in the very life you're living, you're not, you're not doing it. Well, then it's perfect that we talk about the children next. <laughs> the afternoon of the check, sex Absolutely. children, which begins with a little analysis of Lolita and really questions, you know, why this fascination. Uh, and you write that Humbert Humbert was in at the dawn of the fascination with the sex children. We are now in the afternoon of the sex children. And so if you could explain, it's, it's you know, what this fascination with the sex of young children is, because it's more than, it's more than, you know, the, 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 the problem of pedophilia. Pedophilia is in some way being encouraged by the very fascination with youth. So explain that complicated and very interesting argument. I'll try, and this, this is quite good because actually I hope, I'll, I will answer your question and then I hope I can ask you about it too because you have wisdom, <laughs> well, on the subject, but uh, we'll come back. But um, the, 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 um, the question of that essay, uh, it, it was an essay that was, it felt like the kind of footnote or the small part I could do for what I imagined would be a much bigger um, a kind of a, a work of writing of some kind, even a book about uh, sex and sexuality in a contemporary moment. Um, and one that I, I still, I'm not dead yet, I still hope to write something else, but that would take off in many ways from hardcore and from Linda's writings. Anyway, uh, that said, often I feel as if the way you get into a piece of writing, or I do at least, is to figure out what the the kind of immediate puzzle or, or what the dramatic contradiction is, um, the hard knot with which you would start. And in that case, it was um, watching television, listening to popular music, um, thinking about the world in which, I was writing it in my 20s, so the world in which I had recently been a college student, a teenager, you know, 
Um, and why it should be that it often seemed there was this extraordinary value accorded to my life, even as, you know, uh, like a college student and then um, someone single sex in the city in New York or something in the 20s, uh, and specifically a kind of sexual valuation, some kind of tremendous power or capacity or capability that belonged to me. Uh, super valuation, I claimed, in, in the terms of, of the culture, at least watching MTV. Um, and on the other hand, you know, and let's say that rises up from, what, 18, 19, 20, 21, woohoo, right? 22 years old, it's as good as life is gonna get. I hope that's a 22 year old in the, it was like, that's not true. Uh, or maybe it is, it's true. This is as good as it's gonna get. Um, and on the other hand, you know, if you just go down numerically, right? 17, 16, 15, 14. I hope people are becoming queasy or angry. 13, uh, at least in the media discourse, and, and in reality in some ways, don't get me wrong, I'm not a pedophile and monster, but um, you get into actually like the world of super, super uh, interdiction of our, our worst imagination, right? Um, values of crime and evil, and that is to say to sexualize children. Um, and I thought, well, I understand these two things, or they feel they have a kind of naturalness to me, and yet um, their juxtaposition seems odd, uh, or kind of perverse. Um, and clearly there's some switching zone, right, which really ought to cause a problem. What is a 17-year-old or an 18-year-old? Our, like, fantasy person who should be dressed in, um, you remember Britney Spears? She was a star of the late 1990s and early 2000s. You know, someone who should be dressed in, like, an ultra-tight red, leather bodysuit, and on the other hand, you know, to catch a predator, a television show of the early 2000s, um, you know, to try to detect men in the population who would ever be attracted by someone like Britney Spears. Um, so I thought, I'm like, well, can I start from there and can I explain it? What kind of a culture or what kind of a system um, would find value in the juxtaposition of uh, its most kind of fantastic and spectacular sexuality, and then the most evil, most destructive, and um, requiring most punishment sort of sexuality. Sorry, I, I, I see I got excited again by the question and may have gone on too long. But it's an essay that, that tries to track through sexuality and also the kind of sexual boringness of actual teenagehood, which I remembered very well, um, where the supposition is that and, and I think this is true, kind of looking back historically, I don't think mores have, well, that's the wrong way to put it, I don't think the drive structure of human beings has changed. Um, I, I imagine high school is still about like being nervous and meeting people and liking them and loving them and then being disappointed by them, et cetera. Um, and yet, you know, just the particular uh, practices that go with it have changed, right? I think there's a bad Freud joke in that essay, unless I deleted it at the right moment, something like, you know, where petting was, there shall fellatio be, or something like that is bad. But um, this doesn't really make much difference to teenagers, I don't think. Uh, and yet it does make an enormous difference to this superstructure. And um, the claim is that ultimately the, the overvaluation of sexual youth is really about youth and the kind of need, often commercially, to keep up a system in which youth is always exalted uh, as something that you, you the human being, the citizen, the consumer are just constantly losing and shedding to your detriment. You know, God forbid you could uh, be a happy person above the age of 70, 80, and so forth. Um, sorry, I've just, I've mired myself in gloom. Um, well, well, that's true, you do. And this is an essay sorry. that, this is an essay that does not end as hopefully oh. and with as much utopia as, mm. as the others. Mm. Um, in fact, you, you write, let the future at least know that we were fools. Record our testament that this was a juvenile phase in liberation which must give way to a spiritual adulthood. Turn back to adults, see the lines of laughter in the phase, the desire inspiring uh, repositories of wisdom. In, in other words, stop valuing and commercializing youth. Um, make a model for a better era. Rise to the occasion. But then he's, he says, and this might not ring a uh, bell to everyone, but one effort more if you wish to be liberators, <laughs> yes. which is an allusion to the Marquis de Sade. So all of a sudden, you're writing pornography. Yes, sir. 
And to think, and to think, I did that in just one line. You know, <laughs> how many one-line pornographers can you can you? I mean, you're uh, not you? hopeful. You basically say, oh, no, I am it's too though, late for me." Yes, well, that's true. And and then you say it's too late for us. We can't well, change that's, this. That's we true. Are, you oh, obsessed, oh, oh, and oh, therefore oh. we're going to go on being incipient pedophiles because of the oh, oh, obsession. Oh, 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 yes. Aha! Now I see the crux of the problem. <laughs> yes, it's too late for me. Uh, pity me, my friends. Uh, it's too late for us. Like it's too late for us. Uh, that is to say, me and those of us who are prepared to still be enmeshed in this thing. But it's not too late for you. I actually thought of this as one of my great hopeful uh, really? moments, although a parody. I mean, it's a, it's hard to know when you're joking and when you're not. I find. Um, but uh, but no, and and that's actually yeah no now I totally understand because since we've been engaging in this. Um, extended session of, of public psychoanalysis, <laughs> I see that that's exactly what that is, right? Like, actually, I've failed my duty. It should only be the children who are capable of, uh, by growing up in a new world, escaping this structure in which we're already stuck. Mm -hmm. You know, Betty Friedan was stuck. I'm stuck. Um, but the children, that last part is an address to the children, it turns out. Oh. <laughs> it's so a pornographic address to the children, yeah. <laughs> Now that's Oops. really going to work. Please don't, please don't tell the current government. <laughs> okay, let's move to food, and then you can see how this is all working together. Um, how does food relate to sex, relate to exercise? How does all of this sort of come together sure. uh, with, with food? Um, well, yeah, so uh, I, the underlying question for me was, in an era, ours, and in um, a wealthy a kind of enormously wealthy nation compared to the globe, the United States and Western Europe, whatever, um, in which I genuinely believe uh, we have overcome many of the forms of immediate necessity which have dominated human life uh, since, <laughs> I'm starting to sound like Carl Sagan or something, but <laughs> dominated human life since er the earliest recorded time, blah, blah, whatever. Um, like, we, I, I, I believe we genuinely live in an era uh, that was like the one the philosophers imagined, spoke of, but perhaps couldn't uh, ever utterly believe in, one in which it was possible to get your food easily and inexpensively and without hard labor, um, and in which sex... Uh, was decoupled, sexual pleasure was decoupled from the inevitable labor and pain and danger of childbirth, um, and in which uh, you would just not uh, spend each day in either backbreaking labor or endless pursuit of um, the, the bare necessities to sustain yourself, right? We're living in, in heaven of a certain kind insofar as I don't have to think about um, where my food will come from. I don't have to endlessly labor. Uh, shouldn't I be sitting on a cloud of some kind, metaphorically speaking, uh, maybe just a very soft and plush chair, not unlike these, and strumming a lyre, philosophizing, shouldn't I be fishing in the morning, and I forget the whole routine, but you know, you know what one does in the coming utopia. Um, and it seems, in fact, we're certainly not doing that, and, and um, I myself spend uh, far too many hours each day just thinking about uh, what I will eat, and moreover, worrying about it. And, um, you know, wondering, well, it's, uh, rice is not so desirable because it could be quinoa, which would provide me protein. I need more protein as opposed to my carbs. It would be very undesirable to continue consuming carbs. Um, and this particular quinoa, uh, you know, it's not red quinoa. It's, well, I, I'm not a quinoa expert, but someone in this room probably is. Uh, you know, that is to say that we've produce new structures of rarity, it seems, in the very places that at last we've, um, you know, after a civilizational process of thousands of years, at last been freed from certain kinds of necessity that have always been understood as keeping us from the possibility of genuine meaning, a genuinely just society, philosophy, art, etc. cetera. Um, so that's the kind of underlying problem for a number of these um, essays, not because I, in any way, I'm outside the system, and precisely because I do, I do live in it. And the food essay does open with this question of care. Um, this, you know, uh, all of the the food labels which now tell me how much they care about the food they're providing me. They care about the rice and where the rice came from, and how much they care about me. 
uh, and the rice I'm putting into their body. But at the same time, another structure of care, like um, you know, the International Relief Agency that makes sure people aren't starving. Is it children specifically or everyone? No, it's everyone. It's everyone. And so that essay is meant to try to move back and forth between and pull apart a little bit things that I honestly can't really pull apart um, myself, a kind of politics of food and discourse of food, which I do think of as genuinely political and liberationist, um, which can be simultaneously about how everyone in the world could have uh, inexpensive good food, etc., cetera, um, and us too, right? Um, and on the other hand, a, a kind of, it seems often inevitable, simultaneous counter discourse of um, rarity, distinction, uh, optimization. Um, and I, I love to thank you, Scott, for reading uh, a passage. A anytime anyone reads a passage from this book, it's like such a gain because then I don't have to and I don't have to hear my own voice, <laughs> which is my shrill. Why don't I have like a James Earl Jones kind of baritone um, voice? But in that, in that passage, it does seem to me um, very important that a kind of idea has been lost that um, a valuable thing about, you know, uh, human beings as a species is that we manage to eat all kinds of crap and um, and sustain ourselves, right? And presumably, I often wonder, especially about all of the evolutionary stories about food and the, what is it? It's not the Neanderthal diet, the um, paleo, paleo diet. Yeah, the paleo diet, because um, it seems to me like potentially, I, I hope there's an evolutionary uh, um, biologist um, or paleontologist in the room, but it seems such a kind of obvious ideological error, error to assume that human beings are evolutionarily designed or optimized only for the specific, any specific kind of food, rather than that actually the kind of species achievement being that like, you just eat all kinds of crap and keep going. I mean, this is the whole point, right? The, ba the most successfully evolved creature would be one that could eat any kind of crap and, and do very well. And that may well be us. Sorry, that was an unnecessary. But you're not arguing for eating all kinds of crap. No. But, but since we're in Berkeley, I yes. would like to ask you to explain oh. what's wrong with Michael Pollan. Oh. Um, uh, oh Michael. The Omnivore's Dilemma, I would imagine, I think once it was one of the books we were all supposed to read, yes. isn't it, for, for yep. on campus? Um, so, uh, I mean, you have, a, a, I think, a, a smart critique mm. of that. Thank you. I, uh, I hope Michael Pollan is here. <laughs> not. Uh, I feel very bad now that we talk about this. I do think The Omnivore's Dilemma is a tremendous book, which everyone should read, and a genuinely important book. At the same time, uh, I feel it is my duty to say it is in some ways a frustrating and disappointing book. Maybe that's too harsh. Um, you know, it opens with political critique um, and ends in what feels like a kind of rationalization for optimization um, and rarity. And um, I'm sure he's heard this a million times. I wish he were here. Imagine the spirit of Michael Pollan, who would say, I've heard it a million times. So what if I go and hunt a wild boar and eat it with fava beans? What about my political critique? Um, the political critique, uh, factory farming, unnecessary subsidies, valuable. Um, and yet I think there is something actually at the core of the kind of Michael Pollan vision of food um, improvements, which because it cannot separate individual um, like super something, <laughs> uh, not superciliousness, that would be the wrong word, but like a, 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 the idea that what we ought to be doing is satisfying ourselves first or improving ourselves uh, or finding even the best food rather than any food, um, that thought somehow always corrupts uh, in particular writers on the subject. Mark Bittman is another. Um, always corrupts what otherwise are very powerful chains of reasoning. And um, I say this as a non-vegetarian uh, to my shame, although I'm trying to become more of a vegetarian. I do think that you know, one of the key moments in pollen where you can feel um, the loss or mistake is when several chapters all lead to the fact that um, for the sake of humanity, becoming a vegetarian would be a good thing to do. Um, and he more or less says, and I won't, which is fine. Um, but he doesn't say, and I won't, because I'm immoral, 
or I'm weak, or, you know, it's a separate order of life. I, I, there are sets of pleasures which I undertake, or sets of activities which I undertake for me, and then I'm gonna spend some of my time on helping the planet. Instead, there's this kind of structure of rationalization, um, that this too is moral, this too is good. Uh, and I suppose that's the thing that, that, that the essay goes after. And, and also that we're, uh, we're, we're not eating for the enjoyment of food, but for health. The, the, the rationale of health comes in so often. Yeah. And you're sort of saying, look at most of the problems of food have been solved for the planet because we do have this crop of corn that, that can, can feed a lot of people. Yeah. Maybe we don't need corn syrup, but... Right. but um, yeah, I, I do. I mean, health is the, in some way the key, and I think it's the, um, it's the thing that I can't get at. Uh, and I don't, I don't really know who gets at um, that when you know when you go through sets of stories and and structures and practices, behaviors which seem in some way ideological, or you have in mind um, the kind of counter thinking that would be necessary at least to question them, to be skeptical, etc. Um, when you get to the rationale of health, right, saving lives, helping people lead longer lives without pain. Um, everything seems to stop, right? How could anyone be against those things? Uh, for others or for myself? I don't want to die, really. I don't want to die. Uh, although I often tell myself that actually life would probably be much better and I would probably live much better, that, which is to say more honestly and more wisely if I would just commit to dying um, when my time is up and stop thinking I need to stop this thing. Anyway, um, it seems to me actually that that kind of linchpin of health, which we can't go under, really is uh, the kind of, what's, what's like the evil thing that lies underneath all? Is that Satan? Is it the Borg? I'm not a good watcher of these. We discussed the Borg, right? Um, it's, the, like, it's the problem, actually. It's the thing that makes everything else run. Um, and at the, at the end of that essay, it comes to the question of what it would take to renounce. I mean, it sounds, it doesn't make sense, actually, even as I say it. What would it, what would it mean to renounce health or stop caring about it or stop allowing it to be the justification for everything else? But I do think that when you think through all these body practices, it actually becomes the kind of beyond which not, or beyond, beyond which we can't think. Did that answer your question at all, or did I again become excited by the... Uh, what, what, uh, yeah, there's better reasons for living <laughs> than health. Oh, sorry. Yes. No, and there is this basic problem, um, and this this is addressed to my parents, uh, who I grew up in a kind of health food counterculture uh, associated with Berkeley and also with um, certain communities in Massachusetts, Cambridge, Brookline, and the one in which I grew up, Newton, although we would drive to Cambridge or Brookline to get our tofu. Uh, and I grew up in a kind of hypochondriacal household and, and uh, a medical health-focused household. Um, uh, and it, the thing that always troubled me is, is the possibility, I think this is true for many of us, um, that we are endlessly preserving our bodies uh, and keeping them in a state of readiness for things which we will never actually do because we are spending our entire lives keeping our bodies in a state of ideal readiness. And moreover, not actually keeping our bodies in a state of ideal readiness, but keeping them in a state or enmeshed in sets of practices which allow us to feel like they are in the right state. Not even feeling good. I mean, for those of you who do know exercisers, I'm sorry you're here, Gabrielle. Um, <laughs> They get injured constantly. They feel terrible if they skip a day. Like they, you know? Um, and there are benefits to being a slob. Uh, sorry. Okay, so sorry. that leads us to the next topic. And you can Please. see how it all fits together. I'm gonna skip Octomom okay. and, and go to the concept of experience. You know, wh why do we live? Maybe not for happiness, you say, but maybe um, uh, to, discover the meaning of life, and the meaning of life is our experience. So how do you, and you've got these meaning of life little sections throughout, so tell us about that. Oh, well, sure. Um, when, I, uh, when I sat down to try to approach this other unwritten book, except insofar as it's distributed here, The Meaning of Life, um, I actually started uh, from what I thought of as um, those particular ways of living or stylizations of experience, uh, which actually did 
kind of control the way that I, I lived aspirationally, or I saw friends living, other people I knew, um, in which it seemed the common denominator was that you would live for experience, right? Or for the accumulation of experiences. And I remember um, I wrote down for myself all these sets of experiences that were characteristic of, you know, how we would know, um, me, how I would know, my, my friends, that we had actually spent any time living. And uh, I was like, well, sex, drugs, alcohol, vacations, um, beaches, uh, and you know, you get, it's not a surprising list. Um, and, and then I started to try to actually write out uh, <laughs> the history of philosophy, <laughs> right? like since the ancient Greeks. Um, what what were these things? Like, are, are there, you know, we have, and I was in school at the time, I knew, you know, if you go to a philosophy class, they would be like, there are utilitarians and deontologists and, you know, so forth. And uh, I was like, well, what are, are these, are these manifestations of philosophical doctrines that have particular names? And um, I, I said, well, yes, actually, if you look at it, this would be uh, eudaimonistic hedonism. Uh, which was nice. I wrote it down. It seems sort of silly. And then a friend of mine uh, who read an early draft, he's like, that's it. That's what I live for. I live by eudaimonistic hedonism. I wrote one of my college application essays about that. <laughs> so I have proof. Uh, what is that? It's a doctrine in which um, the immediate experience of hedonism, right, pleasure and pain uh, are fundamental. Uh, trying to have more pleasures and fewer pains. Uh, eudaimonistic because it would be um, subtly modified uh, and rationally corrected by an orientation to happiness. So you wouldn't just seek short-term pleasures that would, you know, make cut off your limb. I don't know why that would be fun, but whatever. Uh, you would be like, no, that will deprive me of ultimate happiness. Strangely, um, if you read the news and listen to people um, who are proud of their moral probity and so forth, this does strike me as the kind of philosophy underlying what they're after. Um, and so then I began to think about what the real alternatives are or have been in the last couple of hundred years uh, to just that kind of model of life. Are there people who treat experience differently in order to live in a way which is to them better, uh, often as more um, intellectually uh, ratifiable, let's say, as they look at themselves? And the argument in that, in that essay is that um, there are such things which we don't often talk about and don't get named frequently in the name in the manner of utilitarianism or, or you know deontological views, uh, and the ones that I go after or I try to explain are um, aestheticism, the model in which um, you take up experience in your own life, the people you know, the things of the everyday, uh, as potentially offering you the pleasures that otherwise you would only expect from a work of art. Um, and in which you understand your own life as being a shapeable or moldable object, like a work of art. Uh, and then perfectionism, and this is taken largely from Stanley Cavell's account, um, a doctrine in which you uh, think of your life always as a, a, a kind of succession of possibilities and states in which everyone around you, all of the things that come and circumstances, all of the, even the objects of the world are there to rebuke your current way of living and offer you the inspiration to or possibility of some other next successive self, right? I will go through my life um, as a succession of selves, each modified and changed, and maybe one is not better than the other, but it's different, at least. Um, and in that essay, you know, I finished the essay and I was like, there they are, two possible ways of living. They offer a meaning of life, one which I think has characterized a whole set of you know, people and also people who write things down, thinkers, writers since the 1850s. Um, and people did, they came up to me and they say, wow, that, that uh, essay has meant so much to me because yeah, that is how I want to live. I see it now. I'm kind of, I'm an esthete or I'm a perfectionist. And I would think, oh my God, they took the wrong lesson from the essay. Uh, not because the essay was meant to keep you from doing those things, but it was meant to suggest that these these things are offered offered to us or they're characteristic of, of um, our age and time, but it's not clear they're really satisfying or comprehensive. Uh, and so then I wrote this other essay, um, an essay trying to describe actually the experiences of kind of break or breach in which um, 
such things, especially the aesthetic, uh, but such things as the aesthetic experience stop working and in fact flip over in some way as to make it just totally intolerable to watch television or watch the news or experience stories or dramas of any kind make you withdraw. And that's the anesthetic ideology essay. Um, that was a pretty miserable essay. Nobody, nobody ever comes up to me and says that helped them. And um, and then the others it's, were. It's yeah. not. A, it's not. It's not but, helpful. But I think you know, oh. since you yeah. and I have oh, only sorry. about five more minutes, oh, sorry, or yes. maybe ten minutes more to mm. talk to one another, mm. we have to make some choices. Okay. Um, so, like. Uh, I want you to talk about learning to rap, huh. but I also want you to talk about gut level legislation. Huh. Um, uh, what do you want? Well, skip skip gut level legislation. <laughs> okay, we'll go yeah. to learning to rap. But wait, well, but I, well, if we only have five minutes, I'm sorry. I have um, I have secret knowledge because I know first of all when we were talking earlier that you said you're like I read the anesthetic ideology essay. I disagree. I completely disagree. Um, so not to yeah, it. I don't know if I I'm going to be why. able to okay. really explain my disagreement in in ten minutes, and I don't want to steal any thunder no. from you. Um, so uh, intent for the question and answer. <laughs> Please ask Linda Williams. I also realized I wanted to ask you about. Uh, well, I'm not, yeah, I won't, and I don't want to steal your thunder because this is this <laughs> extraordinary thing. But also the question of yeah, what do you, what you make of. Um, whether there's an underlying structure in uh, the media of sexuality, the media of sex, pornography, et cetera, of the drive to youth, why? Is the analysis right in that essay, or no, is it it's, totally it's different? No, it's absolutely right. No, oh, okay, I mean, cool. I, no, no, it's easy. I mean, the drive to youth, it's, it's obvious. I mean, I should say that Mark is trying to write, or going to write, yeah, a, book on uh, a, a book about pornography on the internet, which is something that I wouldn't touch with a 10-foot pole. Excellent. Um, because I can't, I don't enjoy thumbing through or whatever you call it. Uh, this is clicking a, through. A lesson, uh, if you, you know, you may wonder, uh, what's the best way to go through life? Uh, try to, try to, if possible, buttonhole your heroes and uh, get them in a public forum to say that they are not going to write about the topic that you want to cover. You're write. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> But no, I think you're absolutely right about youth, about the fetishization of youth and how it crosses over into something kind of, as you say, abominable. Uh, and it's just inherent in the culture. And pornography, of course, does the, does the same thing. Um, uh, so. Uh, but you're learning to rap? Is that uh, where you want to? You choose. No, I don't know. I don't, you know. Gut level. Uh, no, no, not <laughs> gut level legislation. Oh, okay. I only say that because I, um, I'd like to add a commercial message. Uh, There's so many words in this book, <laughs> all of them, all of them wonderful, and I encourage you to read the rest of it. Uh, anything I don't cover, you know. Okay, um, learning to rap. But learning to rap, yeah. Well, what do you what do you want to talk about? <laughs> well, why did you oh. set out at for you yes. a late age, but for any of the rest of us a very young age still oh, thank uh, you. to learn to rap yourself? <laughs> what what what? I mean, yeah. and he, he really did in order, you know, right, I don't yeah. think I won't ask you to rap because I imagine well. you're bad, but uh, you did set why. out to learn. And I so did. what was the, it was shame, I think. Yes. That, why were you ashamed and why did you try? Yes. And then why did you stop? Okay. Uh, I still feel shame, I want to specify. And it's weird, learning to rap actually has always, it's a bad it's both the right title and it's the right title because it's a title of which I'm somewhat ashamed. Um, and I vowed, importantly, I vowed never, I, I, will, I will never rap uh, in public. I shouldn't do that. <laughs> it's embarrassing enough. Uh, so that was an essay that was not, it's weird. It's, the, it's I think the only thing in the book that approaches, I hope, um, a certain line of journalism, a kind of stunt journalism, or I did X, I think, you know, I watched all of The Apprentice, which is the most, someone's out there writing that essay right now, but it's probably so miserable to watch all eight seasons of The Apprentice. And that is to say, you know, the rest of the book, when I had had some experience that was characteristically personal, usually I, I would say, <laughs> suppose one does, you know, suppose one sits down in a pile of poo or whatever <laughs> whatever embarrassing experience you've had. In that essay, um, 
it really was just like a compulsive symptom. Um, it was, and it's racially weird. It was two years after uh, Obama had been elected. I think I turned, had I turned 40 or was I still in my late 30s? It's not clear to me when it was written, but I was old, middle age. I mean, middle age, but no, whatever. I was young. It's all how you view it. I assume an audience of college students. In any case. <laughs> Uh, and yeah, like I really did this thing and it seemed weird to me at the time. Um, I'm someone who, not everybody does, I'm someone who knows the lyrics of songs and I've learned over time, it surprised me, there are at least two categories of listeners. There are very, very precise, intense, accurate listeners to pop music who just don't pay attention to the words and almost don't hear them. And then there are other people who are kind of stopped by the words and I'm the latter, or it's functional. And um, so as a consequence, I, I, mean, I feel like I can uh, sing, you know, uh, like a karaoke, the, the canon of uh, pop that isn't hip hop. And yet, even as someone who has always kind of loved hip hop from afar, uh, I realized I couldn't do the lyrics except for the refrains. Um, and uh, I began to think, I don't actually, I wasn't even thinking. I mean, there was a kind of background thought like, I've done something wrong, actually. Um, this is a mistake, or this is racist, or in an immediate way, like I've just missed my own era. I've failed to live in the right time. And it should be said that I, I at a certain, and I know the day, actually, it's in the essay. Uh, I, in my teens, like I felt like I faced a choice, because these were the options then. I would either consecrate my soul to hip hop, um, which would have meant being a white suburban listener consecrating his soul to hip hop, or I would consecrate my soul to uh, punk rock. And I went, I was like, oh, in the end, punk rock. And in hindsight, I think, why did I do that? What would, what would the other option have been like? And so forth. Anyway, so that's an essay that starts from this thing that I did, which is I started trying to um, teach myself to rap the hip hop songs I most loved and admired privately, you know? Um, but it turns out it's incredibly hard to do um, for a variety of reasons, mostly having to do with kind of technical complexity and the requirements of facility and how much practice actually you have to do in order to become, um, what's the, not facile, that would be a bad thing, but uh, eloquent, um, articulate. And then uh, in this world, uh, the university in which we live, uh, I was like, well, how am I going to figure out um, what I'm doing uh, and why? Why this choice? And so I started reading actually a lot of um, sociology and specifically black sociologists on uh, the structure of capital in the 20th century for um, the various black middle classes which rise and fall and, and the kind of world of production of hip hop and so forth. I see, I'm, I see I'm boring you, but I have many sociology texts to recommend. Um, but the essay is meant to kind of uh, work through a, a personal source of shame, not in order to relieve it, but to try to figure out like, what were the objective possibilities in the 1990s? And, and even in hindsight, it seems in many ways the right decision. Um, why, why was it uh, not the right thing for a white suburban kid to be rapping along um, to lyrics about uh, crack trade and um, homicide in you know black neighborhoods in the Northeast, especially, which is where I was growing up. Um, and why is it possible now in a different way? I think if one were growing up now, actually, and I see this among the young people, um, both the white young people and um, and people of variety, people of color from a variety of uh, ethnic origins, actually things just seem possible. And somehow that sense that by rapping along to people being killed um, or to descriptions of street violence and people being killed, you were like a ghastly, ghostly goon. <laughs> I'm not rapping. Uh, that's just, that's just bad. That's just bad uh, alliteration. Um, why have the conditions changed? So in the end, it, I mean, I'm quite proud of the essay in the end because I felt like um, I figured out some of, the, some of the constraints or at least figured out where to point to who knows and you know, wh which scholars know the answer and what their answers are. So. Um, thanks. Um, uh, I'd just like to go to the last essay. Okay. Um, which is, uh, the, 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 at the beginning, Mark talks about being uh, raised near Walden Pond, and it was actually a trailer park. I mean, there, there was, was a trailer, a trailer park, park there. there yeah. um, and at the end, 
he comes back to Walden Pond and Thoreau is a kind of through line in as a as a kind of hero. Um, and uh, you manage to weave in Zuccotti Park and the Occupy movement. Um, and th this has been kind of uh, particularly significant to me for, to read this essay because we have problems at Berkeley about uh, this guy Milos mm -hmm. Yiannopoulos and, and we did a bad job, I think, the first time of, of uh, rejecting him. <laughs> Um, are, you gonna get, are you gonna get another chance to reject him? I, I think we might. Oh, great. <laughs> uh, and so the, the question is, you know, what is the best way? And you brought me back to Thoreau huh. and the essay on civil disobedience in this, in this essay. Um, and I just would like you to, you know, tell us how you weave Zuccotti Park mm -hmm. into Thoreau and mm -hmm. into um, your last essay. Uh -huh. um, yeah, uh, well, so Thoreau, um, to state it very quickly, in, in, the, in the preface to the book, when I was writing the preface to the book, um, I had a problem of how to justify uh, this thing I was doing um, and the kind of bluster or bombast of, I will overturn all, I will, you know, blah, blah, blah. Um, and I originally wrote a long... Uh, a long riddling essay full of puns and puzzles. It was incredible, uh, kind of unreadable, but so powerful. It was like a, you know, one of Nietzsche's introductions from the 1880s, and um, and that didn't completely do it. So then I wrote a long blank verse poem um, in denunciation of the age. You know, it was really it was like Yeats. It was incredible, and uh, I sent both of them to my editor, and he was like, "You dumbass! <laughs> you you spent the summer doing this when you were supposed to be revising your book. This is terrible. You can't do this. Just tell people simply how you ended up like this." And um, I didn't have a good answer, but it is true. I had previously just thought of it as like a weird anecdote that um, when I was growing up, my mother, who was the most important intellectual figure for me, used to drive me to Walden Pond. If anybody's from the area, you know it's the only really good public swimming place in that, the western suburbs. And um, she hadn't read Thoreau. I certainly hadn't read Thoreau. Uh, but we liked to walk around the pond. And there was a, a um, gift shop that sold Thoreau quotes on like bumper stickers and t-shirts and so you knew he was kind of a jerk, right? <laughs> you know, simplify, simplify, beware any enterprise that requires buying new clothes, not, not literally on a t-shirt that you would buy, but that kind of thing. <laughs> and um, kind of the one thing we knew about him was that here was this guy who didn't, he did a strange thing, but not that strange, the more I came to understand about it, in his own town, you know, near his parents, whom he would go see every weekend and do his laundry. Like, he had just gone to live at the side of a pond and, and try to start everything from scratch. More, or, and, you know, actually he didn't. Let me see, even I got sucked into the myth. He would just, like, live simply. He bought a shanty from, you know, a man who was working on the railroad and moving on and built his cabin, blah, blah, blah. And um, knowing nothing of what he said was very helpful because walking around with my mother and figuring out, like, why, you know, why were these people driving Mercedes Benzes to park in the parking lot at Walton Pond? And why was my father so insensitive? I mean, it was often, you know, this is, this is my life. Uh, like, as we were doing this, there was kind of this question in my mind, well, what would Thoreau have thought, right? Like, he's this philosopher, I don't know much about him, but he just, everything was preposterous. Like, he knew the reason why everything preposterous and pretentious and evil was evil, and he would say it. And so I had to be like, well, if you were that kind of person, what would you say? All of that said, uh, the thing that it left me with was this sense of, is there a location within everyday life uh, from which critique would occur, right? not from within the halls of the Frankfurt School, um, not because you're a special kind of person, or even because, you know, or you've learned some body of doctrine, right? You haven't read Thoreau. <laughs> you just know somebody like that existed. Um, and it was, you know, Occupy Wall Street and Zuccotti Park was very, uh, I mean, what was it? It was, for me, very, 
I've, I've lost the power of English. It was for me very incredible. <laughs> and then, you know, I was there like the first day and it seemed very clear nothing was going to happen. And then this thing happened because people much more heroic than I just stayed. And so I was there a lot. I was near my apartment. I went home and slept in my apartment while other people camped out. And yet, um, in kind of watching it for the time that it survived, my experience, even though you would read about it as um, either a manifestation of a particular line of anarchist principle or a manifestation of you know, the, the sentiments of the nation, et cetera, et cetera, it actually looked like uh, the kind of ordinariness in which a small town and its very particular institutions, the post office, like the chowder house or whatever, the diner, um, you know, the, the residential neighborhood would kind of reconstitute themselves with many of the same conflicts and crucially the town meeting, but also with the genuine sense of people living together um, under conditions of self-government, which actually we associate with very simple, you know, kind of direct democracy, New England town meeting democracy, which doesn't much exist anymore. Um, something very humble, but but more powerful perhaps than than other fantastical models that genuinely letting people experience a life of politics. And um, yeah, so that, and that essay takes up this thing which always puzzled me about Walden Pond itself when we would go there to swim, which was that right across from the state park there was a trailer park um, where people had found a way to live really cheaply in trailers, and yet uh, the state park service just prosecuted this brutal war of attrition against the um, trailer park residents to get rid of them, and it's gone now, you know, because it was just impossible to imagine that you could have uh, a state park and people living cheaply but not perhaps aesthetically pleasingly um, to, the, to the evil bourgeois <laughs> across the street. But that's why those three things are woven together and it seemed like a good place to end in the sense that um, I did not want to promise any heroic vision of um, a better politics and certainly that heroic vision, it wouldn't come from me, but that um, some kind of dwelling on, on the, the most simple and fundamental things which allow people a genuinely democratic life was you know, possible. And that's really what the book is about. Yeah. Uh, I'd like to open it up to uh, questions. I think we have people with microphones. So if you would just raise your hand, somebody who, who might have a question. <coughs> um, okay, there's right back there. kind of uh, American obsession with exercise and formalistic gyms and this new foodism and this obsession, obsession with eating at the latest trendy yuppie restaurant and having, you know, wild rice from Borneo and stuff like that. Don't you think it's a product of this whole narcissistic, materialistic, consumeristic culture? Uh, yes. Well, the, the last thing you say... Yes, I think it is a, a consequence of a consumerist, materialist, <laughs> and commercial culture. Uh, and yet Christopher Lash himself and that book, um, Culture of Narcissism, both have always rubbed me the wrong way. Uh, and it's true of his other books too, The Minimal Self and so forth. Although I, his, as a historian early on, he was quite satisfying. And I think Lash rubs me the wrong way because um, in that book and elsewhere, he seems truly to imagine himself apart from it. Um, I, which I suppose, I don't, I, and I don't believe him in some way, or it, 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 it pisses me off, um, in that I think that actually, you have to actually, I think, dwell within the thing to understand its characteristic affects and emotions, and, and it's hard not to dwell within the thing if, if you, if you, unless you're the Unabomber. Um, even Thoreau didn't actually dwell outside of it. And and the other day I was reading someone who was comparing, um, in hindsight, culture of narcissism with, um, it was a funny juxtaposition, but with Norbert Elias on the civilizing process. Um, and I suppose it's the latter perspective that I find, find more powerful, that th there are both short-term and long-term processes of, of um, the way in which quite big questions of social order, how capitalism works, how commerce works, how the state is structured, 
which get into as small things as table manners or what you do in front of other people, et cetera. Um, and one's implication in them is, is, I think, undeniable. You can't simply step outside of them. But there are, let's say, ranges of maneuver within them and um, different kinds of fit or misfit between what you are invited or compelled to do and um, your genuine kind of goals for social hope or what the world would be like. I think Elias was actually quite good at doing that. But anyway, that was a long, perhaps unnecessarily long um, uh, discussion of Christopher Lash. There's a question right down here. Hi. Um, I was re earlier today I was reading on food and I definitely got a sense of I think what, what your project is for this book. And part of the way I thought of it was as this uh, critical task of reframing questions, of reformulating questions. Um, and that it didn't seem assaultive or uh, purely deconstructive, but uh, part of an act of building something new. And so it didn't seem hopeless to me at all. But my question is about uh, this moment of uh, alternative facts and double speak and uh, retrenchment into, or doubling down on uh, our paradigms that we're already a part of. First of all, do you, do you feel like this moment is partly a crisis in the capacity to reframe questions? And then if that's the case, um, you know, uh, what, what do you suggest people can do in their daily lives to, to be open to reformulating their sense of what is possible or what is useful or what is desirable? Oh, that's a great question. I mean, I um, I will say that I um, certainly had the experience after Trump's election, and uh, yeah, alternative facts. God, <laughs> what a dangerous euphemism. <laughs> yeah, in this yes, in a moment of of yes, evil lies um, and so forth. What does one do? You know, I learned publishers always have the fantasy that something will happen which will make your book suddenly relevant. Now that I have a publisher, and um, you know, and I got an email from the publisher. He was like, "Tell me, I need to know for a marketing department. Is there anything in your book that is suddenly relevant because of <laughs> the election of Trump?" And like, I didn't want to, you know, make him cry. But um, my feeling was something like, uh, you know, the book's sort of uh, is like. Um, can we go deeper into our daily practices in a moment, right? Because in fact, we live in a moment, of, you know, we've achieved some things, some progress. And, and I was like, oh no, oh no, none of this is relevant anymore. Like, this is just fucked up. Like, there's no, there's no time to worry about, I'm sorry, I'm not being very articulate about it's this. It's all relevant. Well, in a sense, thank you, Linda. Yes, thank you, thank God. I was hoping someone would object. Um, <laughs> In any case, uh, it does put one a, on a, a somewhat different footing um, because rather than pushing against kind of generous progressive people, right, uh, I think we should, it's funny, like actually we're thrown back a little bit, although I hope in a frame of, you know, orienting yourself to like democracy and, and kind of the immediate local institution and all the rest, um, to like genuine struggle against uh, just, greedy deception and and um, lies so hmm. <laughs> yeah that's probably enough to say oh yeah and yeah, no, thank you. And I'm sorry, I dug myself into a hole of despair for a second. But no, no, no. And actually, the real point in this, sorry, it is important for Thoreau and civil disobedience in the end of the book. It's very, very powerful in Thoreau. It's very powerful in Hannah Arendt um, and in other people who experienced the Nazis face to face. Um, that actually the most useful thing most people can do is just to say no to stuff. And um, and not it doesn't even have to be like a strong no. It can often be a, I'm sick today, I can't show up. I actually remember this at Zuccotti Park. I thought they would appreciate it. You know, in sort of face-to-face -face confrontations with police, I would be like, you don't even, you can stay home. <laughs> just call in sick, man, call in sick. And this actually made them very angry. Because um, they'd be like, I would never betray my office, even though they were stepping on someone's neck. Sorry, <laughs> but anyway, um, but no. As it turns out, the the possibilities for, as it were, just not showing up 
for the things that are wrong and falling back upon individual conscience in a way that we're not used to seems to be essential. And actually probably the great tragedy of the moment is um, that the Republican Party uh, had a whole set of people whom I imagined would just say no, who didn't. Um, they continue to show up because it's useful to them and yet it just seems as if it means that conscience is dead among them. So it's a bummer. Hi, um, I'd just like to say that I think you'd make a great rapper. And uh, you know, if you want to indulge in that later. Um, my question is, um, so I haven't read the book, but it's been on my list and I'm sort of just picking at strands that you've mentioned. So where do you feel this urge or sort of desire for social utopias arises from? And if this is um, a false or sort of paradoxical or unattainable narrative perpetuated by sort of a neoliberal Oh. Elite, sort of fixated by consumerism. Mm -hmm. hmm. From the second half of your question, I may be misunderstanding the first half because, um, I mean, uh, at its base, the the kind of impulse to utopia or to a better world or to recognizing that the the world in which we live is not adequate to us yet uh, or to who we are, I associate, and not because of me, but you know, because of. Hannah Arendt and natality and so forth. I, I associate with um, the strange fact that people continue to be born into a world that they didn't make and that the perspective, this goes to the child question too, that the perspective of the young is always a perspective of um, realizing all the ways in which the world as it actually is and the world of the parents is uh, deficient and doesn't quite measure up to even the possibilities that the child can see in his or her own parents the possibility the child can see for him or herself. Um, so utopia in that sense I think of as, as a kind of inevitable uh, structural impulse of human beings continuing to be born and, and one of the best things there is for, for um, human life, even if it leaves one dissatisfied. Uh, the second part of your question though, I, I think I presume points to the ways in which um, we're invited to particular kinds of utopianism, which I do think of as more destructive optimization, let's say, right? Um, a kind of counting principle in which you should always have more and be better and, and consume the best rather than the good enough. Um, and yeah, I suppose there are many, many names for the kind of forces that, that drive it, it uh, and, and money is involved. <laughs> Hi, um, um, I don't want this to be a plug, but have you heard the new NPR show, Indivisible? No, tell us, tell us more about the new you NPR would show. Be oh. rather, well, they, they're, they're four nights a week, I huh? think they're eight o'clock, KPF, K, KQED. Uh -huh. um, they're, uh, we are undivided nation. Mm. We. And each night they have a different group. And the most peculiar, and the thing I think I would love to know what you would think of this group, is is the Republicans who, when you listen to this show, you realize that they're our allies. <laughs> but it's, it's amazing to hear a bunch of Republicans bemoaning the situation and, and that it's gotten so bad that, that uh, they're also lumped in with the... The, the the queers and the blacks and the hippies and the, the street punks, you know. Mm. Um, uh, there are other knights, too, that do other weird things. One of them is like, um, we should all get along. We should we should uh, listen to how reasonable the other side is. Mm -hmm. And it's, it's, it's really mm. coming from a Republican place, mm -hmm. but it's on NPR. It, sound, it sounds gotta totally great. It. You got to see well, and that's actually, I mean, this is important about the present moment is the kind of consequences of forced choice between alternatives that actually none of the, none of the people voting wants in a certain way. Um, but, but yeah, and certainly in the book, there's a big question of um, what the spaces are, like that show in which you actually get representations of the locality, the community, but also the totality, right? The country of citizens like yourself. Um, there's an argument about whether reality television, you know, works or doesn't work, but um, but shows like the one you described seem totally crucial. 
yeah, to any political community. And weird, yeah, weird in a good way. Other questions right here? Hmm. Turn it on. Yep. <laughs> We don't necessarily see the value of intellectualism in terms of how it relates to the food scenario that you were saying earlier, mm -hmm. that for some people going to an event like this would be, you know, intellectual tofu, and all they want is their junk food of memes and uh, headlines and alternative facts, and because that's what makes them feel good. Huh. Uh, well, I mean, I <laughs> well, um, yeah, I mean, I like, I like, that kind of junk food when it's good. I mean, I guess, in a way, I guess I fall back on, um, this is a, a moment to fall back on a kind of Stanley Cavell formulation in that um, Cavell, a kind of writer about many things, film and popular culture, but also philosophy and skepticism. He had this weird formulation um, when he would take up questions of uh, spheres of radically different aesthetic value, perhaps. Right, where people would say to him, why are you juxtaposing Hollywood comedy with um, Shakespeare or something? Which now actually seems totally reasonable, but, um, and should. Anyway, uh, he argued for um, every domain of human activity, every domain of art and of non-art, of entertainment, of just ways of spending your time as, um, as producing instances of genius or, or kind of something, spark, insight, all the rest. Um, and so I guess, I guess I just don't, I don't see, uh, I would hope, like whatever's successful about a domain of intellect or intellectualism as being different in kind from um, success in all the other domains of human life. And, and um, certainly, like, isn't, I mean, I don't know, that's when I, when I worry, I'm like, what am I, why am I doing this? Uh, you know, I do think, I'm like, well, what do people do? You know, what, like, what are my, what's family dinner like? Uh, what's it like to see your relatives, you know? And the good parts are just, I mean, people are constantly complaining and constantly thinking and something. And the good parts are when, for a moment, the person doesn't just repeat the same complaint they've been repeating for 40 years, but suddenly they're like, wait a second. There's something else to complain about, you know, and it has consequences. And I feel like, you know, the higher complaint, like that's in a way what intellectual work of this kind is. And so I guess the, the plea would be um, to seek for those moments of enlightenment in, in the memes, in the memes too, the cat videos, most important genre, genre of our time. Yes. Yeah, Mark has an essay on uh, what he calls WeTube as opposed to YouTube. And... Um, uh, uh, Charlie bit my finger. I, I, yeah. I, be, I, you know, it's quite beautiful. It's really, yeah. really wonderful. I, yeah, I would say I don't know if Gabrielle agrees, but um, <coughs> double rainbow is that what it's called? <laughs> double rainbow all the way across the sky. Well, right? What does it mean? I mean, it's in a weird way. Yeah, yes, in a weird way, has contributed more to our stock of like what to aspire to in daily life or what transcendence would look like um, than a lot of other things you read. Uh, do we have one last question? There's one right, right up there in the back. Thank you. Um, I guess I'm interested in this uh, idea of health and resistance. And I think one thing that led me is that I think often the oversimplified versions of health we hear are that like a thing is bad for you or is good for you. but the reality is usually that it's more of like a question of like dosage, like a certain amount of something is okay and there's a threshold at which it becomes bad, whether this is traditionally like mental health or like physical health. And that threshold level is also different for each person, right? And so um, I think I'm interested in this idea of like, uh, in like the face of like the Trump era, there's a lot of like questions you see, especially on social media of like, what is the right way to resist? And it's a lot of people prescribing certain things to each other um, even though people maybe have like different thresholds for some things. And the two kind of conflicting things usually seem to be like a principle of self-care and a principle of maybe like sacrifice. And these are maybe require different actions. And I was wondering kind of, how you seem to have thought a lot about this kind of idea of health and resistance. And I was wondering what you would think about these two intersecting uh, ideas or principles. Yeah, I, um, 
I mean, I, <laughs> here's the cheapest answer ever. I think I think what you think uh, from your question in the sense that uh, I too, you know, have been um, very strongly influenced or affected by the kind of late Foucault picture of, um, you know, lines from antiquity through to the present, which think of individual bodily health as um, as kind of practices of navigating between uh, offerings in order to produce a not very rational or rationalized and perhaps not densely rooted in the truths of the body or of the self practice of like, yes, over time I've learned that this is good for me and that's not good for me and it's just, but that's me. I couldn't tell you to do that. I mean, it's a, it's a very strange position, of course, because um, it does seem so removed from a kind of dense realism of what's really good for you or not good for you, although not entirely. Um, that's a little different, though, from what I think of as the, the kind of Trump-era political question of what does one actually do in a moment that's uh, scary and messed up and which one is a citizen and obliged and so forth. And there, there is, I think, a very useful and different um, corollary to this or analog, which is that I think it is crucial to say, but it's really hard when thinking about political organizing or political action, et cetera, to think constantly about the kind of plurality of people and the things they like um, and, and the kinds of ends which they have temperamentally or characteristically or because of the particular biography and, and history they've had um, and let people, encourage people to find the thing to do within that. And what I mean is, you know, it, 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 it seems to me at least that like a, a truly ideal and, and liberated and equal world would, would be one of a kind of plural equality in which lots of different people would get to follow their own peculiar ends, however irrational, right? Like there would have to be a space for people whose just true destiny is to be like rapacious capitalists and stock traders, right? Because they're like gamblers, they have to do that thing. Their highest good is to trade stocks, right? And um, you know, a truly well-ordered society would, would give such people a chance to do that in a way that didn't hurt other people and also didn't like assure them, you know, getting into the movie theater early or, or something like that, like which didn't, or getting their kids into college where people would be able to follow their ends without um, is getting ahead in line in the rest of the whole. And curiously, in a moment of kind of necessary political action, it seems to me the the right perspective for individuals and also people prescribing for other people is is kind of the same. Like you have to encourage people to figure out the thing that they can do that's true to them. Um, I'm not, well, yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. You actually do have more to say about that. <laughs> but but uh, I think we're gonna have to stop stop there. Yeah. And uh, thank you, Mark, very thank much. Thank you so, so much. Thank you, Mark. Thank you very much.